You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 31st, 2023. Our topic today, Dermatology for the Allergist. Our presenter is Dr. Mark Sirota. He's board certified in allergy, immunology, and in dermatology. He practices at Peak Dermatology in Littleton, Colorado. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Conferences Online in Allergy. Today is July 31st. We're coming to you from Kansas City, uh, Missouri and Kansas. And uh, today we have uh, for our first presentation, Dr. Mark Sirota. Uh, Sirota, he is out in the Denver area. Um, he is not only board certified in allergy and immunology, he trained with us many years ago. He went on and, and became certified in dermatology. Uh, he's going to be speaking today on dermatology for the allergist. Um, I will tell you, this is probably one of my favorite talks that he's done this year after year. I've been very gracious to help us out with this. Um, it's definitely a, a listen and paying attention to and definitely go back and relook at it because you're going to learn a lot of good terminology and, and uh, get a lot of good helpful hints. So with that, Mark, I appreciate you being here today. Thank you. All right. Thanks for having me. Um, I a long time ago <laughs> makes me feel old. Uh, <laughs> I guess it was though. I graduated uh, there in 2012, and I did a dermatology residency right after my allergy fellowship. And the the reason was I felt like we see a lot of you know sometimes complex rashes and skin problems in the allergy world, and we're expected to help these patients. A lot of times they think that it's an allergic problem, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. So I, I felt like I wasn't getting, you know, enough dermatology background, you know, it, it, as, as an allergist. And I decided to go back and do a second residency in dermatology. So I really like speaking about these subjects and uh, focusing on the differential diagnoses. And when something comes in and looks like an allergic problem, what else should I be thinking about to make sure I'm not missing uh, a diagnosis that might not be um you know something like eczema or urticaria or allergic contact you know what are the other things i should be thinking about so this is all a talk designed specifically for allergists on how to diagnose and triage uh you know skin problems that you may commonly see in your practice so i'm a consultant and a speaker for these companies none of them are really relevant for this talk i'm not really going to go into therapeutics too much mostly it's going to be a diagnostic talk and I approach this talk by thinking about uh, rather than doing a deep dive into any one skin condition or set of skin conditions, I, I tried to make it a mile wide and inch deep so that you get a good overview of the different types of skin conditions that you should be thinking about when a patient walks in and says, I have this rash, you know, what should I do? So we're going to focus on diseases related to atopic dermatitis, mimics of allergic diseases, and I'm also going to highlight some diseases that you should not miss. There's not too many of those. But those are the type of things when they walk in your office, if you miss them, bad things can happen to the patient and therefore bad things can sometimes happen to you because you missed a ser potentially serious diagnosis or something where you delayed care for someone who should have gotten into care more quickly. So disease is not to be missed. So we're gonna go over the uh, proper way to, uh, to describe skin findings. We're gonna discuss the commonly encountered skin conditions focusing on the mimics of allergic disease. And then we're gonna go over a few treatment modalities and uh, diagnostic modalities uh, as we go along the way. So here are some things we're not gonna focus on. And this list may surprise you because you probably saw the title and said, all we're gonna talk about today is eczema and allergic contact and urticaria. I love those topics. I could probably give you know, an hour, two hour lecture on each of these, but these are things that you're already familiar with. And if you're not, you're gonna get very familiar with them during the course of your training, during the course of your allergy career. So these aren't things that um, I'm gonna spend a lot of time on. I'm gonna focus on the things that look like these things because you'll get much less experience with that, but you wanna be familiar with them. So here's some tools of the trade. So dermatoscope, very helpful for looking up close at skin lesions. And there's whole books on how to look at things under the dermatoscope and look at uh, patterns and try to figure out what it looks like. This is more useful for skin cancers, but still very useful in general. Uh, we have a shave biopsy blade. Not going to go into biopsies any with any degree um, of depth in this talk, but I do give the um, how to do a biopsy as an allergist workshop at the American College of Allergy meeting and the American Academy of Allergy meeting. So 
you go to one of the meetings, you want to learn how to do skin biopsies, they're very fun, they're easy, a nice supplement to your practice, helps the patient uh, get a diagnosis more quickly, don't have to wait for a dermatologist, and also you're seeing it when it's acute and active, and if you send it to me and it takes a month or two to get in, it might not look like that anymore, and it might not be helpful to do a biopsy. So really useful, um, and it's a procedure, you bill for it, it basically doubles the price of your visit, um, and you get useful, useful information. Skin scraping, if you're worried about things like fungus or scabies or something like that, you scrape the skin, you can just look at the superficial epidermal cells and you can get information about them uh, just by doing a skin scraping and placing it on a microscope slide. So dermatology very simply breaks down into two things, rashes or growths. And you're not responsible for growths or skin cancers, so already I eliminated half the specialty for you, uh, but you are gonna be responsible for rashes and that's what we're gonna focus on. However, before I do that, this might be the most important slide of this whole presentation, even though I just said we're not going to focus on growths. This is the growth that you don't want to miss. This is what keeps us up at night. These are melanomas. We talk about the ABCs of melanoma, asymmetry, irregular borders, multiple colors, a diameter greater than six millimeter, which is about a pencil eraser, and an e evolution, something that's growing or changing over time. If you don't remember any of that, remember the ugly duckling. If there's one spot on your body that looks real different than all the others, that's the one you want to pay attention to uh, and let us know, uh, send it to the dermatologist. So you might say, Mark, that's pie in the sky. I'm never actually going to see this. And, uh, you know, I'm not a skin cancer person. I know that, but when you're examining someone's skin, you could pick up one of these things. And this is uh, an example of a melanoma that was picked up about a week after I gave this talk to the Colorado Allergy Society. And an allergist sent me this patient a week later. She had a, a what turned out to be a melanoma near her eye here, and it was referred early. They picked it up and the patient got treated, got it excised, didn't go anywhere else in the body, and she did fine. So this was an allergist about a week after I gave this talk. So remember these images and remember the ABCs. And if something doesn't look right, send it over to the dermatologist. You could save someone's life. Okay, how do we describe skin lesions? So now let's get into how we how do we describe these in our notes? These are primary lesions. I think of these as the nouns. These are like the nouns of the body, of the skin. And then these are the adjectives. This is how you describe the noun. So you could say it's a scaly macule, or you wouldn't say scaly macule, scaly papule or scaly plaque or, you know, um, ulcerated nodule or something like that. So you can take a secondary descriptor, add it to the primary lesion. So we'll talk about how we describe the primary lesions. Macules are less than a centimeter. They're flat, you can't feel them. If you close your eyes, you wouldn't feel a macule. Things like a freckle, solar lentigo, those are macules. Patches are the exact same thing, except it's greater than a centimeter. So if it's greater than a centimeter and you can't feel it, it's a patch, something like a cafe au lait spot or a patch of vitiligo. Papules are less than a centimeter and you can feel them. So uh, example here would be a molluscum uh, contagiosum lesion. Those are a little less than one centimeter papules. So basically the inverse of a macule and a plaque is an inverse of a patch. So greater than one centimeter raised flat topped uh, plaques that are greater than a centimeter. Then we have nodules. Um, so a nodule is also greater than a centimeter but they're more raised circumscribed areas so that you wouldn't really describe this as a plaque. It's not flat and sort of plaque like it's it's a circular circumscribed nodule. So something like a cyst or a keratoacanthoma might be a nodule. And then you have a solid mass under the skin. Um, and that would be an example of a tumor. So this is an example of a lipoma where it's a solid mass that's subcutaneous to the skin. Um, and they're usually larger than nodules. A nodule would be visible on top of the skin. A tumor would be underneath the skin. Vesicles are less than one centimeter, uh, but they're also fluid filled. So if you have a cropped uh, erythematous base with fluid filled vesicles on top, that would be descriptive of herpes simplex, so cro you know, cropped vesicles. And uh, the, they're less than one centimeter and fluid filled. And bullae are greater than one centimeter and fluid filled. So an example would be bullous pemphigoid um, or even burns and things like that can cause large bullae to appear fluid filled bullae. So less than one centimeter vesicle, greater than one centimeter bullae when they're fluid filled. What if they're filled with something other than fluid? If they're filled with pus, then we call them pustules. So an example might be pustular psoriasis or sometimes impetigo as an infectious entity can cause uh, purulent uh, pustules to appear on the skin. Burrows are linear tracts that are 
uh, just deep to the superficial epidermis of the skin that if you say something looks like a burrow, you're basically telling the person you think they're infested with something um, like scabies or cutaneous larva migrans, for example, where an infectious entity um, burrows through the skin um, in a linear fashion. And I'm not going to go through all these different morphologies and way to describe these. Many of these you're probably familiar with, like kinification, for example, is, is where the skin appears more thickened than normal. Ulceration is when the epidermis has been removed. Um, an eschar is a crust, like serum, like serum crust. Oh, sorry, a crust is actually its own thing. Um, but essentially, these are ways to describe primary lesions. So you could say that something has petechiae or purpura or crusted or lichenified and their ways of describing these primary lesions. There are certain patterns that emerge when you look at uh, skin findings for rashes. Um, the ones that I think are most relevant to you, I highlighted in red. So you're probably familiar with dermatomal, for example, which follows along the course of a nerve. So if someone has a diagnosis of shingles, let's say you're gonna see those cropped vesicles I just described, but they're gonna be running along the course of a nerve, for example, um, and there's other uh, types of patterns that you can see. Um, so we'll go over some of these here. But overall, when I go through how to describe skin lesions here, ultimately what you should be thinking about is stop calling stuff maculopapular. Right? I say maculopapular is for rookies. I just told you macules are flat and papules you can feel. So calling something maculopapular when you're describing a viral exanthem or a drug eruption you know, it's not the best way to describe it. So a dermatologist might describe it as an erythematous, morbilliform, blanchable macules, maybe, and papules, if there are papules there too, um, coalescing to form confluent patches. You know, that would be a more elegant way of describing it. But if you're not that familiar with that verbiage yet, another good way to do it is to just do this and take a picture. So I always highly recommend taking pictures that way your colleagues can see what it looked like in real time when you saw it. Always ask the patient, hey, do you have pictures of what this looked like? You know, you said it's been going on for three weeks. What did it look like three weeks ago? A lot of times they have pictures in their phone and if they show you them, then you can um, you can help diagnose it based on looking at what the movie looks like, not just what the photograph, you know, just not just what the snapshot of what it looks like in your office today. So don't forget to ask what the movie looks like when it comes to rashes. So another uh, phenomenon to be familiar with is called the Kebner phenomenon. So we just talked about uh, we just talked about um, where in a distribution along nerves, right? Uh, we so dermatomal distribution. Another distribution is where something has been scratched at. So that can be described as dermatographism, which is where you create hives if you have an urticaria patient. But if you have an inflammatory skin disease patient like psoriasis, for example, and they scratch their skin, you can get what's called the Kebner phenomenon, where you can see that this looks linear. It looks like an outside job. Your body doesn't make this kind of distribution naturally. It's in these nice lines, but it's not it's not a contact allergy. This person has psoriasis and they scratch at their skin in that area and they created a Kebner phenomenon. So this is the dermatomal distribution. Don't miss this if you see it. If something is unilateral on one side of the body, like one side of the neck or one side of the back or, or anywhere that doesn't cross the midline, you have to immediately ask what's happening to that nerve. The most common thing that's happening to that nerve is uh, the uh, shingles virus, right? The chicken pox virus that they had when they were a kid has taken up root in one of the dorsal root ganglia and they've created a rash along a dermatomal distribution. So it stays along the course of that nerve. The tip off is it won't cross the midline. The other side will be unaffected because that's a separate nerve. So most of the time it's going to be something like shingles. But remember, something impinging along the nerve can also create problems there. So you got to ask yourself, is there something like a growth or a tumor impinging on a nerve that's causing a dermatomal distribution? Blaschko's lines is similar, but it's not dermatomal. It doesn't follow nerves. It follows the embryonic development of stem cells, the migration of the stem cells into this Blaschko's lines, which looks more V-shaped over the back, S-shaped over the chest. It's in more of this kind of curvy world appearance. And a good example of this is called lichen striatus, which is a blaschkoid distribution of an inflammatory rash, usually in a child, usually on the arms. And this is called this follows this embryonic distribution. So we see this not uncommonly in kids, 
it goes away on its own, usually in a few years. You can give them steroids if you want, which helps a little bit. But people would look at this and think this kid might have shingles or this kid might have an allergic contact thing. Something streaked the arm there. They brushed up against poison ivy. If you identify that it's in a blastoid distribution, then you think about things that do that. And the, the most common one for children is called lichen striatus. So atopic dermatitis, you are very, very familiar with this. You know all about it. You're going to see lots of patients in your career with atopic dermatitis, erythematous, eczematous plaques, antecubital fossa, popliteal fossa, cheeks of a child, typical distribution. So just remember that it's the itch that rashes. It can be anywhere on the body, and it doesn't always read the textbook and follow this distribution. And the first thing to consider is, is this, does this look eczematous to me? Is it dry, scaly, you know, pink or red in a, in a light skinned person or purplish or hyperpigmented in a darker skinned person? Yes, it is. Now I know I'm in the dermatitis category. Now I have to decide if I can fit it in the classic textbook description of atopic dermatitis or if there might be some mimic of, a, of eczema going on. So there are systemic diseases that are associated with eczema. You're familiar with some of these like hyper IgE, nutritional deficiencies, Wiscott Aldrich. You won't see these very often in your career unless you're in an academic setting. You might see, you know, one or two of these, you know, a year or something like that if you're in private practice. I've never seen one of these in the dermatology clinic because they just, they go to allergy, I think. But these are not common, but you should have them in your mind. And then contrast the typical classic presentation of atopic dermatitis with other things. So one would be allergic contact dermatitis geometric distributions it looks like it's an outside job it's not going to the typical areas and it's in this geometric sharply demarcated usually pattern this person for example had an adhesive allergy um, after their their um, procedure they had on their belly here because they're pregnant this person got admitted for staph infection and was treated with iv vancomycin and they consulted me and i saw them and said send this person home, give them some clobetazole ointment, and that's it. You know, they just have a, a vigorous allergic contact reaction to um, the adhesive that you put on their belly. So um, you just avoid the thing that they were allergic to. You can patch test them and uh, make sure they're not being over-treated for infections. An infection is not going to develop in 24, 48 hours. An allergic contact reaction will. So they can look kind of bad and yellowish and crusty, but it's just a vigorous allergic contact reactions. Here's one from a knee replacement. Metals that are inserted in the body can cause this, and you'll notice that they get the allergic contact right over their knee, um, but it was it's from uh, potentially a knee replacement or some metal that's been inserted, not necessarily. So it's not an outside job, but it's a foreign body that is triggering their reaction. So when you biopsy a dermatitis, you see spongiotic dermatitis, which is this ballooning out of the cells here. You can also see eosinophils, the little pink cells. You can see other inflammatory cells like lymphocytes. Uh, but what you don't see is this normal skin with basket weave orthokeratosis here at the top where it looks like nice bricks that are all made together. There's no white space here. There's no ballooning out and inflammation happening. That's normal skin. This is spongiotic dermatitis. And the reason I show you that is because if you biopsy something, thinking that the pathologist is going to help you by telling you if it is eczema, atopic dermatitis, or some other form of dermatitis. All of these different conditions I'm listing here look like this under the microscope. So there's no way for a pathologist to tell you that. They're just going to give you a boilerplate copy and pasted spongiotic dermatitis description. So you biopsy a dermatitis when you're worried about a mimic of dermatitis. You don't biopsy a dermatitis when you're thinking, I know I'm in the dermatitis category, but I don't really know if it's allergic contact or a drug reaction or a bug bite or something like that. They're all going to look the same under the microscope. So what are diseases associated with eczema? One is called ichthyosis vulgaris, or where you see this fish scaling or mosaic pattern to the skin. This is autosomal dominant, and you just simply treat it with moisturizers or keratolytics like urea or ammonium lactate to break up this extra thickened skin. I think keratolytics are important to remember, though, because if you have a patient that has thickened, lichenified skin from rubbing and scratching and whatever, and you're putting steroids on it or some other anti-inflammatory cream, and you don't break up that extra dead layer of keratinocytes, you're just putting your medicine on top of a shield of dead skin cells. Remember, your epidermis does not have nuclei. You're not gonna affect it by putting a steroid on there because steroids 
act in on the nuclei of cells. If you don't have nuclei, then you're not going to do anything by putting steroids on it. So you got to break up and get through that epidermal layer so you can actually deliver your active ingredient to where the live cells are, where the nuclei are, where the inflammatory cells are. So don't forget to use keratolytics. Things like urea can be very, very helpful. Another disease associated with atopic dermatitis, you can see this is in the antecubital fossa of a child and they have some background dermatitis there, but they also have these flesh colored umbilicated papules. This is molluscum contagiosum, very common to be associated with areas of atopic dermatitis, more, more common in kids because adults usually have already been exposed to it. And it's always a chicken or the egg argument. You know, did the dermatitis that's there cause you to be more likely to have molluscum because of the barrier dysfunction, or did the molluscum being there cause you to have a dermatitis? It's probably some of both. It's hard to say. Um, based on the distributions, like this is in the antecubital fossa, the barrier dysfunction is probably more important, but you can definitely see molluscum dermatitis on areas that aren't typical just for classic eczema. Regardless, you're going to treat it with something. I love intralesional candida because intralesional candida, you inject a few lesions, it stimulates the immune system to go there and sample the, the molluscum that's there, and then they start to attack and destroy all of the molluscum, even though you only injected a couple. So rather than freezing them all off, or scraping them all off with a curette or something else. You can just do intralesional candida, the same type of stuff you use to um, allergy test people, and they do great. Um, you can also use something called a Miquimod cream, which for the uh, board fodder is an agonist of TLR7, toll-like receptor 7, which stimulates your immune system to then uh, respond and destroy those cells that have been tagged for destruction. Here are, is another disease associated with eczema. These are cropped erythematous yellowish crusted papules. So this would be painful. Uh, whenever you see cropped uh, vesicles or papules, you should be thinking about herpes because they like to cluster together. And this is eczema herpeticum. This can be quite disseminated, especially in anyone who's immunosuppressed or in younger children. So you get HSV that's super imposed on a pre-existing atopic dermatitis. You have barrier dysfunction, you have localized immunosuppression, and this can be quite widespread. Um, and you can scrape this and just identify that the HSV is there on immunofluorescence or culture, and then you treat sometimes IV acyclovir, definitely at least oral acyclovir um, to treat this eruption. Another associated condition with atopic dermatitis, you see these honey crusted yellowish papules and plaques um, that's superimposed on this person's background atopic dermatitis. This is impetigo. So when you see this yellowish honey crusted stuff, you should start thinking, okay, I need to treat their eczema with steroids or some or a non-steroidal topical, but I also need to treat the infection that's there to return their uh, microbiome to its natural state of homeostasis. And you can see yellowish honey crusted stuff. You can also see flaccid bullae like this. And these bullae um, are a result of this usually staph, sometimes strep, that are on the skin. Be aware that you can get post streptococcal glomerulonephritis after uh, a strep in Patigo. It's actually more common to have that from skin impetigo than it is to have from a strep throat. So if you're worried about that and you treat with antibiotics for strep throat, you should also be worried about that and make sure you're considering that and potentially testing their kidney function if somebody had an impetigo uh, with strep. Now with staph, that's not going to happen, but if they had strep and you cultured strep, then you'd want to be aware of that fact. Here is a hypopigmented uh, patch on the left cheek and under the left nose of this child with atopic dermatitis. I say patch because you can't feel it. It's not scaly. There's nothing to scrape there. It's just essentially either you visually can see it, but you can't touch it, or it's just very mildly dry because it's associated with their eczema. And this is called pityriasis alba. You see it more obviously in darker skin patients, so that it pops out more in the summer months when people tan or in darker skin patients in general. You can scrape it and do a potassium uh, KOH prep, um, potassium hydroxide prep if you're not sure, and you could see if there's fungus there or not. But if someone has atopic dermatitis, it's not scaly, there's no central clearing like tinea, um, and they, they, they have this history, it's on the cheeks, this is gonna be pityriasis alba, and you just have to basically inform the parent or patient that this is benign and there's you don't need to necessarily do anything about it. 
Contrast that with this, where you see these little groups of circular, oval, scaly um, patches on the posterior neck, around the ear, places where you're making a lot of oil. So it loves around the oil glands of the scalp and shoulders and neck and face because because the organisms that do this are feeding off of those oil glands and this is tinea versicolor so you see it's versicolor because it can take many different forms in terms of the presentation based on the skin color it produces azelaic acid azelaic acid the or when the organism produces that it makes it where you can't produce you don't produce melanin the same way and it doesn't tan the same way which is why it it looks different and lighter uh, when when uh, you're infected with that. And you can see when you scrape it, you see the branching hyphae and the spores associated with Malassezia furfur with tinea versicolor, and you would treat that with a topical antifungal cream. Okay, let's look at some diseases when people are scratching a lot. That's gonna come to the allergist and they're gonna say, I'm itchy, I'm scratching, I think I have an allergy, test me for stuff. And you're gonna say, no, this person has a hyperpigmented patch on the scapula. What's the thing we notice here when you look at the distribution? Does it cross over her spine or is it just on one side of the spine? It's on one side of the spine. So when something is only on one side, unilateral, dermatomal, our brain immediately says, what's going on with the nerve? And if you think about it, if you ever had like a wire fry out like behind your wall, it's going to burn the wall and it makes it look like this brown appearance. So it even kind of works as an analogy. So this is not a wall problem. This is not a skin problem. This is an electrical problem. And this is a condition called notalgia parasthetica. So it is an itchy, dry, hyperpigmented patch unilaterally, usually along the thoracic nerves, T2 to T6. You can treat with topical steroids. You can treat with something called capsaicin, which is the active ingredient in really hot peppers. Um, and it basically desensitizes the nerve. So it, it fires all their neurotransmitters and then they can't, the nerve can't respond like that anymore. But something is impinging or bothering this nerve. Now that could be potentially a mass or something like a tumor. It could also just be that that nerve itself is inflamed as it exits the spine. But regardless, I've had so many allergists after I've given this talk come up to me and say, I, I have this or a friend I know had this, or I've seen patients with this, I didn't realize. So if it's unilateral, it's hyperpigmented, it's over the scapula, and it doesn't have to be over the scapula, there's other areas. Um, like for example, some people get impingement over the hips where it's called moralgia parasthetica and they get the patches like over their hip area. But I show you this more to be aware of this condition and also to recognize a uh, unilateral dermatomal distribution where you're gonna immediately say what's going on with that nerve. Lichen simplex chronicus, another disease from scratching, you can see that it is um, lichenified. That's why they call it lichen. It's lichenified, meaning it's thickened. It's been scratched at so much that it has this extra barrier of dead epidermis on top. And it's chronicus because this person has been scratching at this for an extended period of time. You're gonna need a keratolytic for this and a strong steroid and advise the patient to stop scratching. Paragonodularis is another condition that is associated with picking at the skin. This I think of as more of a secondary diagnosis. The question is why are they picking at their skin? It could be psychiatric. It could be that they have some other skin condition going on that's resulting in them being itchy and scratching and causing paragonodules. But what you see is these picked at nodules where they've picked off their epidermis. It's been replaced by serum crusting. Usually they're in different stages of healing and it'll only be on areas that they can scratch. So it won't be in the center of their back because they can't reach there, but it'll be in their upper back and lower back. And it should be on a bunch of different areas of the body. So if it's only in one spot, again, think about unilateral, you know, one spot distribution, what's going on with the nerve. If it's all over, like both arms, both legs, and they just returned, maybe they're a veteran from war or something like that, then you know, it could be psychiatric, maybe they need some support there. Um, but you gotta do both. You have to treat whatever you think is triggering them to scratch in the first place, and you also have to do something to treat the paragonodularis, usually topical steroids. We can do injectable steroid into the area. And of course, uh, dupilumab is FDA approved now for paragonodularis 18 and up. It turns off the immune component and blocks IL-4 and IL-13. Uh, cytokine signaling, which has been shown to be effective in patients who have paragonodularis. The extreme example of this is neurotic excoriations. This patient was a veteran I saw at the VA hospital, and he was digging at his skin and was so affected by some of the things he had going on um, coming back from war that he, he had dug down to his subcutaneous fat. 
Now, again, if it was just this area, I'd want to know what's going on with the nerves. But if it's um, all over and in different parts of the body, then um, you know it's usually more of uh, the patient's doing it. So another uh, itchy condition that people scratch at, these are erythematous, um, eczematous patches and plaques on the dorsal hand. You can also see that I'm showing you them in the genital area, which reminds you to check the genital area, but also the distribution of the dorsal hand, webbing of the fingers, genitals, waistline, all consistent with scabies. So one question I like to ask when someone has a rash is, does anyone else at home have itching or rash as well? Because most of the things you're gonna diagnose, like atopic dermatitis, like urticaria, like uh, some of these other things, contact allergy, they're not gonna be contagious. They're not gonna spread through the house. So if someone else has a similar lesion, start asking if there's some sort of infestation, either scabies or some sort of arthropod issue in the home, like bed bugs or something like that. Now, look at the hand. You might look at that hand like, oh, that does kind of look like eczema, you know? It's erythematous, it's eczematous. That's true because your body's creating a type four hypersensitivity, a cell-mediated sensitivity to the scabies, mite, and feces that is in the skin. So it's creating the same type of allergic contact reaction that you would create if someone was nickel allergic and they were exposed to nickel. And it can go other places on the skin. That's called an id reaction. It doesn't, it's not limited to just where it's touching. So you might see some eczematous dermatitis stuff, but if you look in the areas that scabies typically present, you're gonna see tracts, you're gonna see more of these papules, like you know these little inflammatory papules and bumps, and you're gonna say, oh, it's in the genitals, it's along the waistline, it's in the webbing, other people at home have it. Yes, I see dermatitis there, but I'm not gonna get distracted by that. I'm gonna know that's a secondary finding, and I need to still consider scabies, and I'm gonna treat it. The way I'm gonna treat it is usually with either topical permethrin cream or oral ivermectin. This is what a scabies mite looks like if you scrape one. Uh, so you can scrape the skin there and try to capture one of the scabies mites, put it on mineral oil, look at it under a slide, and this is what it looks like. This is one I did myself uh, at the Children's Hospital when I was a, a dermatology resident. Uh, got a nice example, and he was alive. He was wiggling around, um, still alive there. So the nice thing is, uh, this on dermoscopy, you can see this thing called delta wing sign, um, where it's this dark triangle. If you're looking at the rash and see if you see that triangle, that can be helpful. And you're going to treat it with either topical permethrin. I really like oral ivermectin. It's one dose, 200 microgram per kilogram for most people. For adults, it's like 15 milligrams or five tablets. You just give it to them once and that's it. I tell people it's kind of like a nuclear bomb for any infestation in the skin, gets rid of their, you know, if they have scabies there, and that way you don't miss it. So if it's an atypical atopic presentation and they have dorsal hands or they have genitals or something else that you don't like about it, if you just do this treatment once, you've, you've uh, without having to scrape it or send it to the dermatologist, you've accounted for scabies. An old school treatment is topical lindane, which had neurotoxicity, especially in little babies and young children. So we do either do permethrin, permethrin cream or ivermectin, uh, and that's it. Here are some diseases you can mistake for eczema. So hopefully everyone can identify this. I think this used to be much less diagnosed outside of the derm world until COVID happened, and then everyone started calling this maskne, and then everyone started being able to diagnose it. So this is erythematous eczematous patches around the nose. It loves hugging up on the nasal ala here, also around the mouth. And you see this kind of eczema with little acneiform papules. So it's kind of like an eczema acne combination. It loves to hug up around the nose. And this is perioral dermatitis or perioral facial dermatitis. It also loves around the eyes. And I've definitely seen it when people use steroids on their face, particularly like if you have an inhaler uh, with a mask or a spacer thing and you get the steroids all around your eye, your mouth. Um, you can get perioral dermatitis, but the official answer as to why this happens is nobody knows. We know steroids can trigger it or make it worse, but many people get this without ever being exposed to steroids, so no one knows exactly why, but I love oral doxycycline for it, this treatment right here. You can use topicals, which I think are about 50% effective. If you use oral doxycycline, it's virtually 100% effective. And this is the same dosing we use for things like acne. So it's pretty safe treatment to do. And they'll reliably be happy that you'll make their um, perioral dermatitis go away. Another facial rash that can be confused with eczema. So you see here again, it likes where oil glands are. In fact, it makes this greasy, oily, scaly stuff. So if you see greasy, oily, uh, scale over erythema and a uh, dermatitis looking picture. Um, if it loves around the hairline, if it loves around the eyebrows, it's an organism that's feeding off of oil glands. 
This is seborrheic dermatitis. In infants, you can see that as cradle cap because they have increased oil gland production, especially when they were exposed to maternal hormones in utero. So you can get cradle cap, and this is treated by antifungal shampoos or creams, plus or minus a steroid to help calm down the inflammation. And there's some non-steroidal treatments that are being worked on and maybe FDA approved here in the future for seborrheic dermatitis as well. But don't confuse this with allergic contact or facial eczema. If it's got that greasy scale, if it likes the nasal labial fold, if it likes the eyebrows, um, consider seborrheic dermatitis. Contrast that with this. So this is an erythematous uh, patch. You can see there are lots of little papules in it that are coalesced. This will look different in different patients, but the tip off is they'll tell you, I know the first spring or summer vacation we go on, I'm gonna get this red rash on my face and it's gonna be there for a week or two. And it's like every time I get sun, like the first time we do like a vacation, like once winter's over. So this is called polymorphous light eruption. Uh, it usually occurs in the first three decades of life in the spring and summer. It's monomorphic for a given patient, so it looks the same every time they get it, but each patient will look a little bit different. And usually you treat with sun protection, avoidance, which I recommend anyway as a dermatologist, but also if you pre-treat them with steroids before they go on their trip, that can actually help quite a bit as well. Um, and it's on sun-exposed areas, so you're not going to see it you know, on the buttocks or something. You're going to see it on the cheeks, maybe on the arms, places where they're going to get sun exposure. Now, you probably looked at some of those and said, oh, I wonder if some of these are supposed to be lupus because it's a facial rash. This is lupus. Lupus, the tip off is, first of all, it doesn't hug the folds or anything like that. It just goes over this whole malar area of your face. They call it a butterfly rash. The second thing is it's kind of nodular. So if you feel this and even just looking at it, you can feel it has this dermal component where it, it feels like nodules. And the third thing is it goes deeper into the dermis. So it's like tacked down. So you can, if you felt this, you would feel that it's kind of like being tacked down to deeper areas, almost like someone took like a tent, a, like a tent pole, like tacking and, and tacked this down to the deeper part of the skin. So you'd feel these little kind of pits or divots. You would feel this juiciness to it where it feels more dermal and it would be over the malar area more commonly in a woman um, who ha may have other symptoms or findings of lupus. Okay, very important, disease is not to be missed. Here are erythematous targetoid papules on the palms of a 20 something year old. So uh, this is on the spectrum of diseases not to be missed. There's not too many things that affect the palms. So when things affect the palms and soles, you can basically look it up in the textbook and say, what are the things that affect the palms and soles? Syphilis, for example, is one. And then one is what this is when you see these targetoid lesions on the palms, which is erythema multiforme. Um, and the tip off here is when you see erythema multiforme, you should think about herpes. The person had a cold sore recently. They're going to tell you I had a cold sore recently and you're going to treat them not with steroids, not with immunosuppressants. You're going to treat them with antivirals for their cold sore that they had recently. Even if they don't have a cold sore, even if they don't give you a history, they had a cold sore. Most of these are going to result from cold sore reactions. And there's no other treatment for the other things that do this anyway. So if you get an erythema multiforme, you see targetoid lesions on the hands, you're gonna treat with acyclovir or valacyclovir. You can get oral involvement. Some of the worst lips you'll ever see are from erythema multiforme and the spectrum of diseases that, that are related to it. Um, and it's not from necessarily the cold sore, it's from the immunologic reaction that's occurring. Erythema multiforme major is when they have mucosal involvement, minor is when they don't. HSV-1 is the most common trigger for this. These are the other triggers, but you'll notice most of them have no other treatment anyway. The common ones are, are uh, HSV and then some of these other things that don't, don't have um, specific treatments like parvovirus or Coxsackie, et cetera. Um, so essentially you're gonna treat this with valacyclovir or acyclovir. Drugs can also cause it. So be familiar with some of the drugs that cause this. And if I could highlight two categories of drug you should always be familiar with, it is sulfonamides like Bactrim, and it's anti-epileptics like seizure medicines. Those cause bad stuff on the skin occasionally, specifically things like Stevens-Johnson, toxic epidermal necrolysis, things that can really hurt someone or even kill them. So if you see someone that has a rash 
one of the first things you want to ask is, have you started any medicines or what medicines do you take? If they've, uh, if they're on Bactrim or they're on neurologic or psychiatric medications, make sure that flags in your mind and you say, do I need to immediately withdraw those things and be worried about a serious skin reaction? Because I've definitely seen lawsuits happen and people die because that was not identified. NSAIDs also, like ibuprofen can cause Stevens Johnson. There's a warning on acetaminophen on Tylenol. There's a warning on the label about potentially causing Stevens Johnson. So just be familiar with some of the over-the-counter things and some of the common prescription things. So when you see a patient like this, the first question you ask is what medicines are you taking? So I can immediately stop them. Don't take another dose of your ibuprofen. Don't take another dose of your Bactrim. Uh, we need to admit you, we need to monitor you. We need to stop everything that could potentially be causing this. So this is Stevens Johnson syndrome. You can see sometimes it's bullae. Most of the time it's more sloughing of the skin. It starts out as more and more biliform rash and then it progresses to sloughing of the skin. Um, but if you could diagnose it here because you identified there just started Lamotrigine or Bactrim, then you're going to be in really good shape because you're going to admit the person and make sure they stop everything. So they think of it as a spectrum of disease. And I love this subject. I could talk for an hour just on Steven Johnson TEN. But essentially, if it's less than 10% involvement in the body, it's Steven Johnson. Greater than 30% is TEN. Mucosal involvement is more common in Stevens Johnson. And if you want a shortcut way to calculate how much body surface area on a patient someone has for their skin, patient's palm is 1% of their body. Their thumb is 0.1% of their body. So if you want to know how much percent of their body it is, you know, 0.1 is thumb and the, the palm of the patient's body is 1%. And you can calculate body surface area without having to remember the rule of nines, which I know every nobody remembers because you guys aren't treating burn patients in the ER. I'm going to skip past some of this for time. The Nikolsky sign, that's where you put lateral pressure on, on a lesion with Stevens Johnson, and it will start to uh, detach from where you're applying the pressure, and that's a positive Nikolsky sign. Usually that's not necessary to make the diagnosis, and it's a little bit mean to do to somebody, but if you have to do it once on the skin to try to figure out that it's definitely that, um, this isn't 100%, but it's a suggestive that you'd have Stevens Johnson TEN. And you could see the mucosal membranes on these people is just absolutely awful sometimes. They can also have urinary tract, anal, and ophthalmologic complications, all the mucosa. So I've seen people misdiagnose Stevens Johnson because they thought the person had a UTI and they were on Bactrim or something, and then they got a rash, and they thought that the rash was being caused uh, by something else, they got a sunburn, whatever. It's like, no, they're on Bactrim. Their UTI is not a UTI. It's that their mucosa is sloughing because they have Stevens Johnson. You don't need to give them more antibiotics. You need to stop their Bactrim, right? So don't forget throat, lips, mucosa, eyes, uh, urogenital, um, all of those areas. You can calculate a score 10 score to uh, predict mortality. The sooner you stop the offending agent, the better prognosis the person has in terms of mortality. That's been studied and shown. Here's all the different causes drugs, but also infectious etiologies like mycoplasma, for example. But don't assume that. If the person has a URI and you're like, oh, I think this is mycoplasma, they're coughing, et cetera, okay. But in the meantime, let's not give them Tylenol or ibuprofen for fever, because if it turns out it's Stevens Johnson, it was from the ibuprofen they got at home from their URI, you're going to drive the process and make it worse. So stop everything that could be confounding their problem when you're worried about Stevens Johnson and TEN. Um, there's a few other things I like to say about it. The main one is TNF alpha inhibitors is what I would want. So if I come to the ER and you happen to be taking care of me and I look like I have Stevens Johnson, give me a Tanercept, give me Adalimumab, give me a TNF inhibitor that's used for lots of different stuff like psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis and all those conditions. Give me a shot of that and then start asking questions because there's copious data now in the literature that if you give people TNF inhibitors early, they do way better than patients that don't. Um, and it can definitely save someone's life. You're not gonna hurt anyone by doing that. IVIG, okay, plus minus. Systemic steroids, probably not. Supportive care, yes. But if you wanna do something to actually affect the patient's course, I, th I say give a TNF inhibitor first and ask questions later. I've seen some people turn around that I definitely thought were gonna go in the wrong direction just by giving them a single dose of a TNF inhibitor, like a Tanercept, which is Embril, or um, Adalimumab, which is uh, Umira. Another uh, not to be missed, erythematous circular circumscribed plaques, classically in the bathing suit distribution of the body, but could be anywhere on the trunk, arms, usually spares the face. 
You might think this is psoriasis. You might think it's a really bad eczema patient, et cetera, but they're not going to get better with the typical treatments. And this is cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, CTCL. It's usually pruritic. It's usually in the bathing suit distribution. It's usually misdiagnosed and delayed by an average of, I think, seven years or so. Um, so from the first time they present to the time they actually get diagnosed is severely delayed. And that's because it can look like other things. It goes through different stages. But if someone is not responding to typical treatment, you know, you put them on dupilumab, it doesn't really help. You give them steroids, it's kind of plus minus. It may, it's in the bathing suit distribution. It's not on the face. You know, they present it as an adult. Um, start thinking about CTCL. And it can present just as total body erythroderma. So you might look at this patient and say, oh, this is just the worst eczema patient I've ever seen. But... Again, presented later in life, not responding to typical therapies, the whole body's red. Ask yourself, what is the cells doing in the skin? Are, are there lymphocytes that are bad actors that are causing this to be more diffuse and difficult and red? Take a biopsy. You might see an abnormal biopsy that confirms uh, CTCL. If you're not comfortable taking a biopsy yourself, come to the workshop or refer it to a dermatologist who will take the biopsy for you. And this is what you see. You see too many for too little. Look at all those purple cells. There's tons of lymphocytes there. All these purple cells are all lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are basically all nucleus. But look what's not there. A lot of inflammation. You don't see the spongiosis. You don't see um, bacteria. You don't see any, any issue stuff. Why are all these lymphocytes there? You see these collections of lymphocytes called potriase microabscesses. These are sterile. They don't have bacteria or anything in them. They're just collecting each other. And uh, it's too many for too little, too many lymphocytes for too little inflammation. There's nothing going on. So um, this is because all these cells are homing to the skin because they are CTCL cells. They're cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, and they are, um, it's a cancerous process. And you're going to refer them to dermatology for localized treatment, and oncology is going to treat them if they need something systemically. Talked about dermatomal distributions, another one not to be missed. We don't miss this because it's in the dermatomal distribution. It's the right age group. They didn't get the sh chickenpox shot. They got actual chickenpox. So, they, you know, they're in their late 30s and up. They never got the chickenpox vaccine. And we want to treat this early to avoid complications of, of um, paresthesias and neuralgia. Um, and uh, it's most effective if you treat early. So don't miss this, especially if it's in the V1 distribution of the face. Because if you're involving the nasociliary branch, um, you could cause someone to have permanent eye damage or blindness. Not that you would cause it, but you wouldn't prevent it. So if you see a, a dermatomal distribution, even if it's early, even if it looks pretty faint and it's just a little pink, um, if they say it's burning or itching and it's in one, dis one nerve distribution, um, at, just ask yourself, why is this not shingles? Um, most of the time, it's going to be shingles. Another one not to be missed are purpura that are lining up in the inguinal folds of a baby. So you see seborrheic dermatitis here, right? You see this little yellowish, scaly, greasy plaque, and then you see these little purpura there as well. This is very concerning in a baby um, when you see this kind of distribution. So really bad cradle cap, really bad seborrheic dermatitis, lining up in the inguinal folds, and petechiae. Those are bad warning signs for Langerhans cell histiocytosis. Most of the time it just gets misdiagnosed as a diaper rash or sebderm, but eventually when it gets biopsied, it needs an oncology referral and systemic chemotherapy um, for Langerhans cell histiocytosis. So mimics of numular dermatitis, sorry, let me just check on time here. Okay, good, got, got some time. Numular dermatitis. So the points for numular dermatitis, this does look eczematous to you, hopefully. It's got erythema, it's dry, it's cracky, it looks like that eczema rash. And it's all filled in here. So you can see these are all filled in. And so it just looks like a circular plaque of eczema, which is exactly what it is. Numular dermatitis. Numulus in Latin means coin-shaped. The other word is discoid eczema. It's confused with tinea because people can't realize the subtleties of the difference. But I just gave them to you. It's filled in. It's erythematous, eczematous. And there's not like some area of scale around the outside. It's all just one circular plaque of eczema. You're gonna treat that with a potent topical steroid. Here's one that kind of looks like that, but it's more dusky colored, purplish or hyperpigmented. And it's, I gave you the head of the penis specifically because that is the classic place where this develops. And if you take a history, like I told you about rashes and say, have you taken any medicines recently? They're going to say that they took a certain medicine recently, like an NSAID, and every time it happens, it's after I took that drug. This is fixed drug eruption. 
It occurs 30 minutes to eight hours after the drug's administration. If you discontinue the drug, it simply goes away on its own in seven to 10 days. And if you don't take that drug again, it wouldn't return. If you want to prove it to yourself or the person really needs that drug, you can reintroduce it and they should get a fixed drug eruption in the same place they had it before. The most common examples are antibacterials. Again, you see your sulfonamides there and you also see NSAIDs. This is why I don't prescribe Bactrim for UTIs unless I really, really need to. Because law of large numbers, if you give enough people something, someone's going to get Steven Johnson, someone's going to get fixed drug eruptions, they're going to get other stuff. So if you need it, you use it. You know, for people like I remember as a fellow patient had chronic granulomas disease, the gold standard was to prophylax them with Bactrim. I did it. But if you're just treating empirically for stuff, sulfonamides are more prone to causing potentially serious problems for people. So I avoid them unless they're necessary for me. This is post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. You could confuse this to fixed drug eruption, but it's not associated with any medicine they took. It's not itchy. It's not burning. It's not painful. It's nothing. And they had something there previously. Like this would be the end result of numular dermatitis. Now they have PIH, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. I say it's the paw print of where the animal used to be. There's nothing to do with this for this. It normally fades it's over time. If you wanted to do something, there are fading creams we can use, like hydroquinone 4% cream. We call them bleaching creams, and it'll stop the melanin production in the skin. But if you just wait, these usually fade away on their own. Just don't confuse it with something else. It's flat. There's no symptoms to it. You just reassure. Now, contrast numular dermatitis and fixed drug eruption with this. Now you see a ring. You see erythema with an area of central clearing. You might see little bumps along the outside. You might see some leading scale where these become like kind of scaly as this lesion is pushing out. This is tinea corporis. This is ringworm. Um, and you would scrape this and get a fungal culture, or you could look at it under the microscope. Or if you were pretty sure that's what it was, because it's on a typical area like the back of the neck or the shoulders, and it has this central clearing, and it all makes sense, and it has this little scale here, you can just, just treat it with an antifungal. So when you scrape it, you're going to see, on again, on a KOH prep, you're going to see the branching fungi, branching hyphae and um, spores uh, associated with the fungal infection. But what you shouldn't do is treat a fungal infection with a potent steroid like clobetazole. So if you saw this person's neck and you forgot this lecture and you said, oh, I think this is numular dermatitis and you put clobetazole on it, then you're going to do this. You're going to cause someone to have a Mayoki's granuloma where essentially you've driven the fungus deeper down into the layers of the skin. And now instead of topical antifungal creams, you bought the person four to six weeks of oral antifungals, and this is more difficult to treat. Kind of looks more shiny, sometimes more purplish because it's deeper down, so it doesn't look pink or red anymore. And um, that's from the use of potent steroids on a tinea infection. Now contrast that. Now I'm going to really confuse you. Contrast that with this where you say, okay, I got it, Mark. This is tinea, has central clearing. I'm good. No, you, I told you, look at the central clearing, but then I said, look to see if there's scaling around the outside. No. Then I would say fungus is superficial and infects the superficial layers. And this looks deep. See how it looks like there's a dermal component. You felt this and this like is this ring. You can feel it. It feels bumpy. It feels deeper. It has a dermal component. This is not tinea corporis. It's also on the dorsal hand, which is the most common place for this. This is called granuloma annulare. So annular again means ring-like or, you know, so it's a, in, a, in a ring shape. And you can see that there's no scaling, it feels dermal. It still has the central clearing, but this is more juicy and dermal feeling. And it lo loves the dorsal hands, but it can really be anywhere on the body. But again, no scale, not itchy, not superficial feeling. This is granuloma annulare. This is an inflammatory, benign granulomatous condition of the skin. Biopsy can confirm the diagnosis, but it's usually unnecessary. I don't treat it unless it's bothering the patient because it's not usually symptomatic. So the only thing it bothers them about is the appearance of it. And then you can use strong topical steroids. You can inject it with steroids, which is probably what's been done here, why these little, um, little blood areas are. And um, sometimes you can use systemic treatments, but you don't have to do anything for that. This is psoriasis erythematous salmon colored plaques with white or silvery scale. You can see that they have these yellowish nails. So a lot of people have nail changes. Sometimes it's very difficult to tell the difference between psoriasis and eczema. And then you look at the nails and see if they have nail uh, findings here, like these little oil spots 
or you can have pitting of the nails where it looks like someone took a little ice pick to the nails. These are psoriatic nails and the salmon colored white silvery scale is psoriasis. It's a TH17 mediated disease and there's lots of treatments for it these days, all the ones you've seen commercials for on TV, um, like blocking the cytokines that TH17 signals by. So different cytokines than what you would target for an eczema patient. And if you target the wrong one, not a big deal. They're not going to get better and then you're going to treat them with the opposite. So sometimes you're not sure and it's hard. You're not sure if it's eczema or psoriasis. You treat them with one biologic, they don't get better. And you say, okay, maybe I was in the wrong pathway. Even on biopsy, sometimes it's not 100%. They'll come back and say psoriasiform dermatitis. And you're like, I don't know what that means. It looks like both under the microscope. It looks like both on the skin. So sometimes it is hard to tell the difference. And then you, you treat it and you see if it gets better. Hopefully you wouldn't miss this though. These are the classic areas like elbows, knees, genitals versus eczema, which is the opposite, the folds of the elbows, the folds of the knees. This is the anterior uh, part of the knees, for, for example. So what, what salmon colored plaque with white silvery scale over the knees, elbows, genitals, umbilicus, scalp, those are classic, classic psoriasis areas. You can also get guttate psoriasis where it looks teardrop shaped and in children it's associated with strep infection almost always. Palmoplantar plantar psoriasis, where you get pustules on the palms, is kind of an unusual one. Inverse psoriasis, you might think, oh, Mark, that's definitely, you know, that's intertrigo, that's candida, that's getting an antifungal all day long. This is getting an antifungal all day long. No, this is inverse psoriasis. Uh, you could see this white silvery scale. You can see how it's inverse. So it's inverse is inframammary, axillary, genital, and you can also um, notice, notice that it's bilateral. So it's not affecting one, it's affecting both. Um, I definitely miss this kind of stuff in my allergy fellowship where I thought this was candida or I thought it was, you know, contact allergy from their underwiring and their bra or something like that. Be aware of the inverse distribution of rashes. If it's bilateral and it's an inverse distribution, it could just be an inflammatory skin condition like that they have like psoriasis and it's in, it's, it's, it's in an inverse distribution. You, psoriasis looks typical under the microscope, so we call this the psoriasiform pattern, where you see this extension of the reedy ridges that are fused like that. That can occur in other conditions, but the classic one is psoriasis. So when you biopsy classic psoriasis, it should be very straightforward for a pathologist to diagnose for most classic things. We don't use oral steroids for it, we use these other things. Similar to psoriasis, you can see this Kebner phenomenon in both conditions. This is called lichen planus, where you see these purple polygonal papules that are pyritic, otherwise known as the four Ps of lichen planus. Purple, pyritic, itchy, polygonal, so these little geometric shapes, um, and um, papules. They can Kebnerize. It's associated with hepatitis C and other drugs as, and drugs as well. Um, and if you see these purple rashes, that you'll know what it is. They called it lichen planus because someone thought it looked like lichens on a tree. So they thought this looked like that and they said, we'll call it lichen planus. You can get oral involvement with it. And a lichenoid drug reaction or a lichenoid pattern is where you get this band of lymphocytes on pathology. So if you ever get a pathology report and it says lichenoid, all they're telling you is it looks like lichen planus under the microscope. Not that it is lichen planus, that has a lichenoid reaction pattern, meaning these lymphocytes are occurring as a band in the epidermis here. So um, that's what lichenoid, uh, so a lot of times I'll just see that as like lichenoid drug reaction on a biopsy and they're like, I understand drug reaction. I'm gonna start to figure out what drug it might be, but what does lichenoid mean? Lichenoid just means that they're seeing these, this band of lymphocytic infiltrate, which classically looks like lichen planus. You can treat it with these different treatment modalities. This is one that always shows up on boards. I'm sure it'll be on that Fitbull thing because it's on there every year. Um, this is where you scratch, you know, you rub at a lesion and it, the patient has something like this and you rub one of the lesions. It could, they could just have one of these or they could have multiple um, and you rub it and it urticates, it causes a hive. So this is urticaria pigmentosa when it has a lot of these and they're pigmented like that. Or you could just have a solid, solitary mastocytoma, for example. But the sign that they want you to know when you rub it is called Darier sign. Uh, and it causes the urticarial reaction when you rub at it. Um, I recommend giving an epinephrine auto-injector for any patient that has urticaria pigmentosa or some other mastocytosis issue, not necessarily a solitary mastocytoma, but anything that's more diffuse than that, because they are way more likely to have anaphylaxis from venom stings than the average person who gets stung by a bee. So I recommend they have an epinephrine auto-injector. So if it happens and they have anaphylaxis on first exposure, they don't die. 
Uh, this is a photo distributed rash. So this is lace-like erythema um, that is on the upper back. You'll notice it's not on the lower back down here. So it's where the sun is, is exposing. And you can see how it has this kind of pattern where it, it, it reacts where the sun had hit it. This is subcutaneous, so, excuse me, subacute cutaneous uh, lupus erythematosus, SCLE. So you can see it called polycyclic. So if you see this polycyclic looking stuff, you might not know that it's lupus, but you should know that there's some autoimmune or vascular component to it. Like it's a blood vessel thing. It kind of looks like blood vessels. So don't mistake this for something else. And then I want to show you uh, this phase of bolus pemphigoid because if you get a 75 year old patient who's a new chronic urticaria patient or even a new acute urticaria patient, there is something called urticarial phase bolus pemphigoid. So it, every urticaria patient is not just urticaria. And if it's an older person, you think about bolus pemphigoid because there's an urticarial phase to it. Once they present like this and it's um, bolle, then you're going to know that that's what it is. But if it is urticarial, um, you might think that they're chronic urticaria and put them on omalizumab or something. So uh, just be aware of that. And I guess I'm probably out of time here. Or was that it? Yeah, sorry, yes. we're we're a little bit past eleven. So oh, okay, sorry about that. Wrap. Can I can I give you can I give you one last thing? I'm gonna give you Please one last do. thing. Okay, I'm gonna give you the Sirota rule. The Sirota, I wanted to name something after myself. That's the only reason I want to tell you this. So the Sirota rule means you can't damage someone's skin by putting steroids on disease skin. So you have to go from disease and then normal, and then you can damage them if you keep putting steroids on. So people are always afraid of steroids and causing atrophy and stria. You have to pass go, you have to pass through normal. So if you're putting steroids on eczema, you're not gonna cause that to be damaged till it gets to normal skin first, then you tell the patient to stop, then they don't get damaged from their steroids. So don't be afraid of potent steroids. Just advise the patient, once you get to normal and you put out the fire, stop and don't put any more steroids on. So thank you very much uh, for inviting me to talk today. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. And if we're out of time, um, I'm happy to answer them offline uh, later as well. Thank you. All right, thanks, Dr. Sorotto. It's fantastic talk as always too. Um, I, one quick question or comment. Um, are, are there, is there a particular website you'd recommend for the allergist to visit that might uh, be readily available so when we're in clinic on the go and can make good decisions? Yeah, so there's an app called Visual DX, and it was it's founded and was started by a dermatologist. And I know Children's Mercy has free access to it. Like if you belong to an academic center, including Children's Mercy, you can get it for free on your phone. You just log in with like your Children's Mercy email, and you can literally put in any diagnosis, and it will give you all of the information on that diagnosis and differential diagnoses of what else you should be thinking about. They have great pictures. And if you know how to describe skin lesions, it even has a function where you could say, I'm seeing erythematous plaques on the anterior knees and the elbows. And it will tell you, here's the differential, psoriasis is up there, et cetera. So visual DX for doctors, up to date I love also for doctors. And then for patients, there's a, a website called Derm NZ for New Zealand. They have basically every common skin diagnosis and like a one pager handout for patients on that diagnosis. And even for a doctor, it's helpful to reference sometimes. And it's a very simply written one pager on a diagnosis. Okay, thank you. Very, very helpful. Um, again, um, I really appreciate you doing this once again. I know it's year after year, but I think it's very helpful to do it in live format and any updates along the way. So um, with that, we're gonna conclude this first talk. We'll move into the second. I apologize, we won't have any break time, but uh, feel free for everyone to stand up and stretch in the background.